Hello and welcome to Old Timey Book Review, where I review books that are out of print, out of date, and oftentimes out of memory. In this video, we'll be looking at a peculiar little printing of one of George Bernard Shaw's plays. This is the Shaw Alphabet Edition of Androcles and the Lion. Published in 1962, it is printed in the traditional Penguin Book Orange, orange to denote a work of fiction. When it comes to the cover, for me, what's most striking about this contrasting orange and black image is these peculiar symbols that are superimposed over Shaw's face. There's a mystery there. What are they? As you may deduce from the title, this is the first many people would have seen of the so-called Shaw or Shawvian alphabet. That's what you saw at the start of the video on this little whiteboard. Hello being made up of these four symbols at the top, and to and of, each being a single symbol each, and book, to make it plural, just add a simple S-like symbol there. But we'll get into the construction of the alphabet a little later in the video. As with the previous Old Timey book review, what's interesting about the publication of this little volume is not necessarily the text itself, but the historical context that brought it into being. For the history of the publication of this little book here involves a dying author's last wish, a protracted legal case, and fundamental questions about the makeup of the written English language. There's a lot to unpack here. Let's start with the eccentric author. Bernard Shaw, Irish playwright, activist, and winner of both a Nobel Prize in Literature and a Best Adapted Screenplay Oscar, died in 1950 at the grand old age of 94. It took 12 years from his death until the publication of this little volume in 1962. But this is not just a reprint of a play. It is the result of over a decade of research design and legal battles following the reading of his last will and testament. You see, on his death, Shaw left behind detailed instructions for the creation of a new phonetic alphabet for the English language. It was one of the more original bequests in any will of the 20th century, at least that I've come across. In it, he directed his trustee, Sir James Pittman, to use income from his estate for the creation of a new alphabet which was to be designed within these three parameters. The first parameter, it had to be at least 40 characters, as opposed to the Latin 26, as this larger number was considered to be better suited to the English language. The second parameter, it had to be as phonetic as possible, meaning that each letter had to correspond directly with the sound it symbolized. The third and final parameter was that it had to be visually distinct from the Latin alphabet so as not to confuse the two. At least 40 characters, as phonetic as possible, distinct. These are the three parameters that would shape the Shorvian alphabet. Now, a question arises here, one that you may be thinking yourself, and that is, why exactly would Shaw request such an endeavour that many, I suspect, and for good reason, would consider to be pointless? To understand this, you must realise that in life, Shaw had a fascination with the English language, its power, its characteristics, and its usage. His most famous play, Pygmalion, later adapted into the musical My Fair Lady, is all about speech patterns and accents in the very hierarchical English culture of the early 20th century, and how the way one speaks signifies not merely one's social class, but one's potential social mobility. The story of Pygmalion follows Professor Henry Higgins, an academic specialising in phonetics, that being how speech sounds are made, and his friend, Colonel Pickering, an expert in linguistics, the study of language. At the start of the play, they come across a poor Cockney flower girl, Eliza Doolittle, and embark on a project of transforming her manners and speech so that she may appear an upstanding and elegant young lady at an ambassador's garden party. To the men, it is little more than a game, at least at first, but to Eliza, it becomes a question of her social worth. Pygmalion was written in 1912 and demonstrates how Shaw was interested not just with accents, but pronunciation. Remember, even more so than today, and it certainly still is, 
English society was very hierarchical, with clear class boundaries, and one of the primary identifiers of your class and place of origin was how you spoke. Shaw was Irish, born in Dublin, but spent most of his life as part of the English art establishment, and therefore he would have been very aware of the contrast between his manner of speaking and that of those he directed on the English stage. Furthermore, he did not solely live off his writing, but his public speaking as well. He was very active in engaging with the new speech technologies that were appearing at the time, these technologies that recorded and transmitted speech. Here is a clip of him speaking in 1922 for a De Forest phono film. I should explain, these were a series of quite innovative shorts that displayed the use of synchronised sound half a decade before the first synchronised sound feature films would appear. So, here is Shaw talking about his plays in 1922. You really ought, all of you, to have come to the place from which I am now addressing you, and that is Malvern, quite the best bit of England, because we have made a theatre in Malvern, practically a new theatre, all for your accommodation, and uh, we are going to do a number of plays, uh, which are all written by me, I may say, and therefore, they're not uh, the old sort of play uh, that makes you, uh, persuades you to laugh when you are not really amused, and which persuades you to feel very emotional when there's really nothing the matter. And my plays are all in the business of providing the new minds and the new souls. Continuing his consideration on manners of speech, Shaw became a member of the BBC's Advisory Committee on Spoken English in 1926. This was the committee that went on to define that very distinctive form of BBC presenter, RP, received pronunciation. Shaw himself discussed this committee on a gramophone recording for the Linguaphone Institute in 1928. The two simplest and commonest words in any language are yes and no. But no two members of the committee pronounce them exactly alike. All that can be said is that every member pronounces them in such a way that they would not only be intelligible in every English speaking country, but would stamp the speaker as a cultivated person, as distinguished from an ignorant and illiterate one. To summarise, when it came to speaking, Shaw fought in terms of presentable English rather than a strict, correct English. To put it simply, the importance is the meaning of what you say being understood, not to make everyone sound identical. What all this shows, from the story of Pygmalion to his interaction with the new speak technologies, is that Shaw had fought deeply about English pronunciation throughout his life. Following this obsession, he became a reformer and quite outspoken in his displeasure at the failings of written English to reflect phonetically the spoken language. The conclusion he came to was that the Latin alphabet was suboptimal for English. Simply, he saw written English as inefficient and slow, both in terms of writing needless letters, but also in terms of teaching. I quote, I need not repeat familiar arguments about the waste of teachers' time, and the difficulties thrown in the way of English children learning to read their own language, or the fact that nobody without a visual memory for words ever succeeds in spelling conventionally, however highly educated he or she may be, or the barrier placed between England and France by both nations using their printing presses to conceal their language from one another. This was an impassioned argument he gave in a letter to a newspaper in 1901, and it reflects his sharp wit too. I'm sure at some point, not just in our lives, but recently, we've all struggled with some of the peculiarities of written English, particularly in terms of spelling. A word as common as tomorrow is one of the most commonly misspelled, as is misspelled, is it one S or two? It's two, but misled is one. That's of course because miss is a prefix added to a word and spelt begins with an S, 
but you don't pronounce two S's as it's written. Misspelt, misled, misspelt. Anyway, I digress. It was not just the difficulty of teaching spelling that Shaw wished to rally against, but the time wasted on the spelling itself, when, he believed, the matter could be simplified enormously to make the act of writing quicker and easier. To quote another of his letters on this very topic, this one to the Times in 1941, he proclaimed, It is, I suppose, for lack of such an estimate of wasted time that we do not think it worthwhile to lift a finger to get an English alphabet. The king, who has to spend an appreciable part of his time signing his name, which in southern English has three sounds and should be spelt with three letters, has to write six, a hundred percent waste of his time, with a result so equivocal that Herr Hitler speaks of him as King Georg. Before I go on, I should explain that, as this is the second old timely book review, I'm bending the rules a little and introducing a second book for the purposes of covering the topic of the Shaw alphabet in literature more fully. This is Shaw on Language, published in 1965. It demonstrates quite thoroughly Shaw's preoccupation with the English language, and I'd suggest it as secondary reading behind the Shaw alphabet edition of Androcles and the Lion if you are interested in this subject. There we are. Inside this book, it also reprints Shaw's introduction to Richard Albert Wilson's The Miraculous Birth of Language, where Shaw wrote about the infamous English tetragraph O-U-G-H, specifically in relation to cough and tough. Both of these end in a th sound, yet one pronounces the O in the middle for cough and the U in the middle for tough. As Shaw points out with both these words, if someone were to write them tough, T-U-F, or cough, C-O-F, they would be accused of illiteracy, even though they would be understood by any English speaker unless they are themselves entirely illiterate. Shaw despised these needless complications in spelling, occasionally referring to them as Johnsonese after Dr. Johnson, the compiler of the first dictionary, which standardised much of English spelling. A further example alongside cough and tough would be with the word plough, which in incorrect American spelling replaces the final three letters with a W to make a more phonetically consistent word. But as I said, it is American spelling and therefore incorrect, albeit incorrect in a more appropriate manner. In fact, Shaw disliked the use of the English spelling O-U-R at the end of a word ending with or or er, such as in colour and honour, in favour of the American shortening, because it's pronounced colour, not colour. So, no matter how much you insist on spelling it our, in phonetic terms, it doesn't make much sense. Shaw enjoyed such transliterative experimentation to display the inconsistencies of written English. Uh, one particularly famous example, which is sometimes attributed to him, but it seems that he was quoting, not inventing, is the famous spelling of the word fish, G-H-O-T-I, fish, G-H-O-T-I. Although it may look strange at first, the logic is to use the G-H in laugh, th, th, the O in women, I, I, and the T-I in nation, sh, sh, fish, G-H-O-T-I, fish. It seems completely nonsensical, but by the patterns of written English, it can't be completely written off as ridiculous. Moving back to Shaw directly though, he practiced what he preached. If you read the scripts of Shaw's plays, including this one, he often left out apostrophes, spelling don't, don't, for instance, and most of the time he distrusted the use of hyphenated words, choosing to either keep them separate or connecting them outright. When writing by hand, Shaw used Sir Isaac Pittman's shorthand, and it was that Pittman's grandson, Sir James, the man named in Shaw's will, who strove for over a decade to see Shaw's last wishes fulfilled with this reprinting. Here, from the BBC archive, is Sir James Pittman talking about the proposed new alphabet in 1957. 
And is this what the proposed new alphabet would look like? Uh, well, that is the principle of how the letters would be made up, but whether that would be A, B, C, D, or whether it would be M, R, Q, Z, or whatever it is, there won't be a Q, incidentally, and uh, that is one of the points. There must have got to be 40 letters for the English language. A different number of letters for different languages, but the English language does require 40 letters for doing a good job. Uh, one letter to represent each sound? Each sound, yes. yes. Never more. But do got two A's, for instance, here. Yeah, that's bad. Do you think, Mr. Pittman, that ordinary people like me, halfway through life, could learn to change over and read stuff like this? Yes, undoubtedly. In, in a week, you could easily learn it. But with 40 letters in the alphabet, Mr. Pittman, instead of only 26, won't that mean much longer books? Oh, no. Both the very fact of having 40 letters and the fact that each one of them can be shorter or more compressed than uh, they are at present means that we shall have only about half the space occupied by a word. And that's very valuable. It means books cost only half the price and means the British Museum would save millions and millions because, after all, uh, their shelving would be required only half the same number of books. This was the principle, at least. The comparison was the change from Roman to Arabic numerals when it came to numbers. They were quicker and easier to write. Therefore, the fundamental advantage of a newly designed Shaw alphabet was a utilitarian one. He did not state that the new alphabet would entirely replace the old one. Roman numerals are still used in particular contexts. But Arabics are dominant for their ease of writing. And that was the point. Ease of writing and reading. 1957 was also a significant year for the proposed alphabet because it was this year that Shaw's will was taken to court. Where there's a will, there's a litigation, as is the saying amongst solicitors. And supposedly Shaw even hoped that his will would be opposed, as that would provide ample advertisement for the enterprise. I'm not sure how important this was to the choice to bring the will to court, but it seems to have some bearing. You see, royalties made by the Shaw estate had increased the previous year with the newly licensed adaptation of Pygmalion the Broadway musical My Fair Lady. The money to the estate was flowing in. In 1957 it was contested, and those contesting it included two institutions that were set to receive money from the estate after the Alphabet Trust, namely the British Museum and the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art. The court case is remembered as Ari Shaw deceased, public trustee versus day, 1 WLR 729. 1957, Ari Shaw for short, and is still cited to this day when it comes to the creation of charitable trusts in the UK. Now, I'm not a lawyer, but from what I can gather, the issue with Shaw's will was that he directed a charitable trust to be created for the purpose. He had the right to request that a power undertake the creation of a new alphabet using funds from his estate, but that power did not meet the criteria of a charitable trust as laid out, which therefore made it invalid. Essentially, the objection can be summed up in Judge Harmon's quote to the court, if the object be merely the increase of knowledge that is not in itself a charitable object unless it be combined with teaching or education. The lack of teaching at the heart of the creation of the new alphabet is what held it back from being considered a charitable trust, and Judge Harmon held that the research and propaganda enjoined by the testator seemed to me merely to tend to the increase of public knowledge in a certain respect, namely, the saving of time and money by the use of the proposed alphabet. There is no element of teaching or education combined with this, nor does the propaganda element in the trusts tend to more than to persuade the public that the adoption of the new script would be a good thing, and that in my view, is not education. By propaganda, he is discussing the marketing of the new alphabet as superior and for the purposes of arguing a political cause, i.e. the inferiority of the Latin alphabet for English-speaking peoples as opposed to the proposed Shaw alphabet. The court gave no opinion on whether or not a new alphabet would necessarily be beneficial. That was not their place. However, the purpose of the trust that was created in Shaw's will was the researching of the benefit of the phonetic alphabet 
that it had put itself in charge of creating. As such, it was to be the primary beneficiary of such research, not a charitable cause to empower English-speaking individuals through the existence of such a phonetic alphabet. To give a recent example of citations of this court case, Ari Shaw, it was cited in relation to Wikipedia's charitable trust status in the United Kingdom, as Wikipedia is used for the accumulation and sharing of existing knowledge, with free access so long as one has the internet, but not a platform for conducting its own research for perceived self-proclaimed benefits to society. Therefore, as I understand it, in British law, Ari Shaw is a negative example of how one should not establish a charitable trust. Due to the court case in 1957, the dream of a Shaw alphabet was brought to a halt. Almost. Following Ari Shaw, the trust was revived by Pittman and head of the Shaw Society, Barbara Smoker, with a smaller goal. They made a settlement out of court with the British Museum and the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, who had contested the will, as well as the National Gallery of Ireland, which hadn't, with financial backing from these institutions to the tune of £8,300, which is around 75000 today by inflation, they could only afford to publish a single book. And here it is. Before the book could be published, though, there had to be a short alphabet. As such, in 1958, the public trustee announced a competition to design the Shorvian alphabet with a prize of £500. They received around 450 design submissions, but by New Year's Eve 1959, there was still no single design that was deemed suitable. However, there were four that stood out. It was decided that the prize money would be shared between these four winners, and the final design was amalgamated by one of the winners, Ronald Kingsley Reed, into this, the Shorvian alphabet. Once it was finished, the Shaw alphabet edition of Androcles and the Lion was transliterated and published. Copies were sent to many of the major libraries in English-speaking countries. The paperback version available in bookshops that you see here came with a detachable key inside, as well as a copy printed in the back. This key shows all of the letters and gives some explanation on how they function. It is designed so that one can teach oneself the alphabet using the key, and the play itself is printed in both the Shorvian and the regular Latin alphabet side by side to get a grasp of how to read it. The alphabet you see here is designed with Shaw's three caveats in mind. It contains 48 symbols, it is designed to be phonetic, and it is distinct from the Latin alphabet. Moreover, as you can see from these pages, it takes up only two-thirds of the space required by the Latin alphabet with conventional spelling. What are the basics then? Well, in the Shorvian alphabet, there is a single case, no upper or lower, and proper names are simply preceded by a dot. One of the most practical features is that it uses single letters for four of the most commonly used words in the English language, namely the, of, and, to. This speeds up writing. For consonants that are similar, they use essentially the same tall letter but flipped or reversed. The best example for me is that of thigh and they, where the sounds are spelt the same in the Latin alphabet but pronounced a little differently. The standard of pronunciation was set on the speaking patterns of King George V. This standard was chosen by Shaw and has been described by some as Northern English in a broad sense. As this video is a book review of sorts, I should probably talk a little about the actual text. To summarise the story of Androcles and the Lion, Shaw's play of a much older fable, the narrative follows a group of persecuted Christians as they are led to the Colosseum to fight and die for the amusement of their Roman masters. The title character, Androcles, one such Christian, is an unassuming, rather pitiful fellow who, in the prologue, helps a wild lion who got a fawn trapped in its paw. When they are reunited in the Colosseum in the final act, the lion refuses to attack Androcles and they instead embrace fondly. This seeming miracle convinces the Roman emperor to stop his persecution of the Christians and he himself converts. 
Let's open up the book then for a little demonstration. I will read a section of the prologue where Androcles first meets the lion, while on screen I'll put the short alphabet edition for you to follow. Androcles and the Lion Prologue Overture Forest sounds Roaring of lions Christian hymn faintly A jungle path A lion's roar A melancholy suffering roar comes from the jungle It is repeated nearer The lion limps from the jungle on three legs holding up his right forepaw in which a huge thorn sticks He sits down and contemplates it He licks it He shakes it he tries to extract it by scraping it along the ground, and hurts himself worse. He roars piteously. He licks it again. Tears drop from his eyes. He limps painfully off the path and lies down under the trees, exhausted with pain. Heaving a long sigh, like wind in a trombone, he goes to sleep. Androcles and his wife, Megaria, come along the path. He is a small, thin, ridiculous little man, who might be any age from 30 to 55. He has sandy hair, watery, compassionate blue eyes, sensitive nostrils, and a very presentable forehead. But his good points go no further. His arms and legs and back, though wiry of their kind, look shriveled and starved. He carries a big bundle, is very poorly clad, and seems tired and hungry. His wife is a rather handsome, pampered slattern, well-fed and in the prime of life. She has nothing to carry and has a stout stick to help her along. There we go, a man and his lion pal. It is a simple fable of sorts, it isn't a bad read either, short and has some witty dialogue and lively characters to drive it all along. Not Shaw's best perhaps, almost memorable, but simple enough to serve as an example if one were trying to learn the alphabet by using this play as a tool. Now for a conclusion to this old timey book review. The flaw with the whole enterprise, the newly designed Shaw phonetic alphabet, was not that it was poorly designed, just that no one really cared enough about the problem with the Latin alphabet for it to catch on. We've got stuck in our ways in that regard. It may not be perfect, it will evolve, but it's fine. In the book's introduction, it suggests readers try using the new alphabet by writing letters to similarly inclined friends. And it should be remembered that Shaw used Pittman's shorthand when writing early drafts of his plays. And perhaps, as some use shorthand standard or of their own invention, the Shawvian alphabet could be used with practice by anyone similarly in agreement that the current alphabet for the English language wastes time and ink. I suspect if someone were to try to invent a new alphabet for the English language today, one of the primary concerns would be how the alphabet would be laid out on a keyboard, more than necessarily the handwriting itself. At least that would be a factor. I should add that there have since been two notable transliterations of works of fiction into the Shaw alphabet, namely of Alice in Wonderland and Pride and Prejudice, both of these in the last decade. And the website shawvian.info is a hub for the alphabet if you want to look into this subject further. You can even download the font. Overall, this book is evidence of an interesting episode in the history of the study and criticism of English spelling. The Enterprise is notable because it was instigated by one of the foremost playwrights of the early 20th century, and it also has the added element of a still sighted court case wrapped up in the tale. This book is a reminder, at the very least, that all books, as objects in of themselves, their context, as well as their text, have a story behind their publication at any given time. And some of these publication stories are fascinating in of themselves. If you happen to find a copy of the Shaw Alphabet edition of Androcles and the Lion on any of your outings, whether that be to a library, a second-hand bookshop, a charity shop, I really would suggest, at the very least, picking it up, flicking through and seeing the comparison of the alphabets on the page. It really is quite fascinating. Anyway, thank you for joining me for this old-timey book review. I hope 
he'll join me again. But for now, I'll leave Bernard Shaw to give the goodbyes. Thank you. Well, goodbye, 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 goodbye all of you. <laughs>